Okay, so I'm Daniel Spielman. I go by Dan. I was an undergraduate at Yale University where I majored in computer science and mathematics. I got the BA degree in both as opposed to the BS. I did a PhD in applied mathematics at MIT where I, well it was in applied mathematics, I was essentially studying theoretical computer science. I then was a professor in applied math at MIT for a while, and I'm presently a professor at Yale University with a long title. So my, I'm joint between the departments of computer science and the department of statistics and data science, which is a new entity. And then I have courtesy appointments in mathematics and applied mathematics. So. I am mainly motivated by trying to solve problems that are of interest to computer science, but the way that I do that is usually through using tools of mathematics, and combinatorics is one of the main sources of such tools. So actually when I was in graduate school, I think I took more courses in combinatorics than I did in computer science, because it was the combinatorics courses that taught me a lot about how I was going to, or taught me the techniques that I would later use to solve problems. Um, I started out doing research in what people think of as complexity theory, literally trying to prove lower bounds, trying to prove that things were hard to compute. I now work mainly on the other end of complexity, which is algorithms and trying to make efficient algorithms. Again, all throughout this, I'm mainly using tools from combinatorics and other areas of mathematics, though once I use tools from those other areas of mathematics, they then look like combinatorics, but using tools from combinatorics to solve computational problems. So today I'm going to talk about algorithms for solving systems of linear equations, which is one of the most fundamental computational problems that comes up throughout computational physics and uh, many, many other areas. It gets used in machine learning and in optimization and operations research, and I'll talk about some of the applications of them. But I'm really interested in getting the lowest complexity algorithms possible, at least for nice families of systems of equations. And, we wind up using a lot of surprising combinatorics in this effort. So one of the first things that I learned about in combinatorics that was really exciting to me was something called expander graphs. These are incredibly useful graphs. I'm sure that other people in this program are talking about them and studying them. And when I first learned about them, they were sort of an amazing thing to me. It was surprising they should exist. And, but I saw that they were useful for a lot of things. And my thesis was about using expander graphs to make error correcting codes, at least a good part of my thesis. And now I'm back again using expander graphs, but or was using expander graphs and ideas related to them to help solve systems of linear equations faster. So these things sort of keep popping up. It's a very fundamental idea. It's been useful in a lot of places. Um, I noticed that on the website for the center here, they mention my work on the Caddis and Singer problem. And that was partially inspired by studying expander graphs. So expander graphs to me were a sort of miracle. And once I knew that that miracle was true and existed, when I saw the Caddis and Singer problem, it seemed like it shouldn't be solvable, except that it looked like the same sort of miracle was required. And later when I did solve it the way that I did this with Nikhil Srivastava and Adam Marcus, was we actually first came up with a new way of constructing Ramanujan expander graphs. And then the same techniques we used in that proof enabled us to solve the Caddis and Singer problem. So the, and the, these topics all intermingle in strange ways. So that work was also motivated by work that I'm talking about today on solving systems of linear equations. One of the main things I'm going to discuss in my talk today is how do we analyze networks, by which I mean something like a social network, where you're given a bunch of things and you know what's related to what, or who's friends with whom, and how do you understand them. And I will show us, I'll show three ways that Laplacians help us do this. The first one is just graph drawing. If I give you a network or a graph, if you can make a nice picture of it, then you really feel that you understand it. For example, if I give you a graph of the United States, literally I mean each state is a vertex in the graph, and let's say I put them next to each other if the states are next to each other. When you look at that graph, you understand something about the structure of the United States. Um, 
I might try to show you a graph of your friend network. Imagine that we put each of your friends on the board or on a piece of paper somewhere and then try to, try to draw lines between them, connecting them. But those get messier. You actually discover typical people's friends' networks cannot be nicely drawn. By which I mean if you try to do that, your paper is just completely covered with the edges and the names are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and things are connected that are far apart and you don't get any locality. So some networks are hard to draw. So the next thing we do with those networks is we try to cluster them. By which I mean we try to break them into groups and figure out what are the natural groupings and hopefully then most of the edges appear within the groups rather than between them. So with your friend network, you know, there are typically groups of your friends from high school, your friends from college, different activities you're involved in, or friends from work. I will talk a little bit about how we use Laplacians to do clustering in networks and how do we find that structure. The last thing I will touch on, although the first one that will appear in my talk, is how we do inference in networks using Laplacians. Imagine you know something about some of the nodes and want to make inferences about the others. Uh, the example that motivates me here is people studying protein-protein interaction networks. So they have a node or vertex for each protein. It acts like a person in a social network. They know that some proteins interact with each other. Those you can think of as being friends. Those have edges. And now, let's say I tell you that some proteins are involved in a disease, and you've done some studies to figure out that some other proteins aren't involved in the disease. Which proteins should you look at next? How do you decide which ones are most likely to be involved? Well, probably the ones that interact with others that are already involved. And that's a crude way of thinking about it, but we'll use Laplacians to come up with a much more refined way of thinking about this and to try to help us make better inferences. Um, that, it turns out, is a completely heuristic exercise, meaning we have a mathematical formulation of what we want to do, and it is some degree a matter of luck or chance if it's actually useful, but at least it's better than going with nothing. It is also closely related to the way Laplacians were used historically. So they were first studied, to the best of my knowledge, within people doing physics. They're used if you want to model electrical flow in networks of resistors. Or if you want to understand what happens if you have networks of springs and understand how the structures behave or how heat flows. A lot of physical simulation was first done by analyzing Laplacian matrices and solving systems of linear equations in them. And we're still borrowing techniques developed from that literature today. Just looking at very, very different sorts of structures because, as I said, your friendship network if for a normal person looks nothing like anything you can draw nicely in two or three dimensions, but most of what physicists have been studying can be. So I'm a big fan of trying to promote interdisciplinary collaboration. It, it's part of why I run this Yale Institute for Network Science, which is a home of one part of the interdisciplinary network at Yale. We foster collaboration on network science there. Um, I think that a lot of the most interesting advances in science are made by collaboration for, with people from different fields, or at least people from one field learning about the problems that people in another have. Most of my work has been of that flavor. So I spend a lot of my time trying to design algorithms, but the question I'm faced with is, well, what's the next algorithm I should design? What problem do I want to solve? I like to try to get my problems from other scientists or other disciplines. So across my career, I've worked on problems that have come up in things like digital communication or optimization and operations research, or these days more numerical linear algebra and machine learning. But in each case, I'm trying to get problems that people have in other areas that they don't know how to solve. And where, if we can come up with a new algorithm that will help them solve it faster, then it would be useful to them. Now, this doesn't necessarily require regular interaction in order to do that. Rather, it requires me understanding their problems well enough for me to be able to go to do something with it. And that's one very reasonable type of interaction that you have, scientifically speaking, where um, you know, one group has a problem, and if they can explain it well to the other people, then the other group can go off and solve it. 
there are a lot of other cases where you do need much more tightly coupled interactions. I'll admit I've usually seen this most successfully done in industry, more than among professors, where usually everyone has a mission, they want something to succeed, but they have different parts, so they know different parts of how to do it. And then you will get people often going back and forth and exchanging ideas and improve, you know, one person makes an improvement and then someone else says, ah, but we need it to do this. And they're like, okay, well now we'll go do that. And they, they go back and forth and make things better and better iteratively. But it is a lot of where new ideas come from. Um, so one of the things I really am trying to do always is make a list of problems to one day work on. I know what I'm working on now. I don't need any other problems right now. But when I'm finished solving the problems that I'm working on right now, then I need to think of what's the next good thing. And where I look is often all the ideas I've heard in all of the talks that I've gone to over the last few years. And that's one reason if you see me in talks, you will see me taking notes all the time. Not just because it helps me pay attention during the talk, but then because I can go back later and look at it and try to recover something. And there are big stars in my notes where there are problems that I might want to work on later. Okay, so I'm working on a lot of different things these days that might seem fairly disconnected, but they all make me happy, so I continue to work on them. So I have one line of work related to pure mathematics and studying the geometry of polynomials, which turned out to be a very useful tool that I used in studying expander graphs and in solving the Gattison Singer problem, and I think there's still a lot to be gained from it. So this is going back to understanding where are the roots of various polynomials. You know, one of the first things that we actually make, I don't know, grade school kids learn how to do is find zeros of polynomials. I'm trying to find new ways of reasoning about where those lie. And these connect with a lot of problems in mathematics, but I feel it's an underexplored area. A completely different sort of work that I'm doing is spending my time, say, implementing algorithms for solving systems of linear equations. That's part of what my talk today will be about, because there's still a lot of systems of linear equations that we need better algorithms for, and I really enjoy programming and implementing these. Some of the sorts of problems I'm working on these days come from trying to design algorithms for solving really big data problems, where I guess a lot of people, when they think about big data, they think of the challenge as being, oh my gosh, how am I going to store all of this data? I don't think of that as the problem. I think that if you have a problem even storing your data, you're never going to be able to compute anything interesting about it. Because it takes much more time to compute with your data than it does to store things with your data. So there's a lot of problems I've encountered. I don't know if I can solve any of them. But I have many colleagues with very large data sets with no way of doing any meaningful analysis of them. And I'm trying to figure out, is there anything useful in their data that will enable me to help them achieve meaningful analyses? And can I develop a theory behind it? And that's the other thing you really need in this area. If you're actually going to be looking at people's data and then using the results of it to set policy or make decisions, you need to be sure that what you're doing is statistically sound, not just that it sort of looks right or you know, works in practice, as we like to say. So there's some very challenging problems here in making some statistical algorithms fast and rigorous that I'm looking at these days.